Welcome back to the Bottleneck Guy podcast. I am Clark Ching, and today I have a very exciting guest for you all the way from Australia. We've got Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. And today, Steve is... Oh, hang on, hang on. Sorry, my mistake. Today we have a very exciting guest all the way from Malta. We have Steve Tendon. Steve is the co-author of the recently released book, Tame Your Workflow, How Dr. Goldratt of The Goal Would Apply the Theory of Constraints to Rethink Knowledge Work Management. And we've got him for a good half hour. Hello, Steve. Hello, Clarky, and hello to the whole of the world. Right. You, with Daniel, have written a book that's just come out recently, and it's on TOC, Applied to Software Development, but with an emphasis on Kanban. Cool if we could just talk about that for a wee while, and then maybe even over time have a, a couple more chats about it. So tell us about your book. Why on earth did you write a book? Why on earth would someone think about writing writing a book? For me, it's not the first time I get myself into this kind of crazy projects. Uh, I've written quite quite a few books. But this one is, uh, I think, is very special because of the topic. The, the previous book, which maybe uh, you might uh, know, the, um, the one on, I called it, Hyperproductive Knowledge Work Performance, the Tameflow Approach and its Applications to Scrum and Kanban, was like presenting to the world my uh, my way of thinking around these topics, but it was uh, it was like um, going 360 degrees in all possible directions, and then yes, also uh, getting to TOC, getting to Kanban, getting to Scrum from a TOC perspective, and it was written in 2012, 13, and since then I have been focusing a lot in my thinking about, well, where is this constraint? Where is the herbie in, uh, in knowledge work? Uh, because I think that has always been uh, the key question that actually has prevented the adoption of theory of constraints uh, in, uh, in knowledge work. We've had previous attempts uh, with David Anderson's uh, first book, I think it was Software Engineering Management, where TOC was was being introduced to the world of software, of software engineering, software engineering management, but uh, it uh, it didn't turn out to be very very actionable or pra- practic- practical. And as, as a matter of fact, uh, that uh, that school of thought um, quickly died out and was replaced by by Kanban with uh, with uh, column width limits and and so on. The uh, the reason for that was simply that it was too hard to actually pinpoint where the constraint was in uh, the flow of work that you have in uh, uh, knowledge discovery workflow setting, as is typical of software development. Mm-hmm. And okay, I must give you some some more background here to understand or where I I'm coming up from. Yeah? Because um, my way of thinking, which now has the name Tameflow, has, has a very long, long story behind. But originally and still, the whole approach is based on pattern and pattern theory, uh, Alexandrian patterns, to be more precise. Mm-hmm. And um, I was always fascinated by high performing organizations. And uh, I. Uh, came very early to, to realize that those companies that uh, outperform the competition, they are driven by two or three fundamental patterns. One is what I call the unity of purpose, and the second one is the community of trust. Um, where you have this unity of purpose and community of trust, things happen very, very quickly. Why? Because uh, we are all pulling in the same direction, uh, if uh, you make a decision to do something, I can trust you because I know you're going in the same direction as, as me and vice versa. Um, a lot of, of um, uh, discussions and uh, focus and energy are not wasted in, uh, in fights, but they are squarely aimed at moving the company forwards towards its, uh, uh, its, its goals. Right, that makes sense. So you focus on the same goals and, and, and solving the same problems. 
Exactly, and, and already from the wording, you you certainly uh, uh, perceive like the connection with Goldratt's the goal. Uh, uh, but at that time, I was not aware about Goldratt's work, not at all, not at all. So, so the the origin of my of my works is patterns and pattern theory. But then, when uh, when I uh, discovered TOC, and I dis- did so precisely with David Anderson's software engineering management book, just the idea that you, you could have a constraint. And of course, I immediately went off a tangent and then got every book about TOC that I could find, starting from the gold. So th- this idea that if you can identify a constraint, then that becomes like a, an undeniable um, focusing point. It becomes so much easier to create the conditions for this unity of purpose to emerge. So it was just matching perfectly what I was doing. But then we had this problem. The theory of constraints was not really applicable. It was not easy to apply to, to the world of, uh, of software engineering or more generally uh, knowledge work. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then when David Anderson like, uh, uh, announced that uh, he had uh, um, evolved uh, towards this um, software uh, management approach, which he called the Kanban method, inspired by by Teichi Ono's Kanban. I thought, well, yeah, that's that's also a very good idea. Visualizing the workflow on on a board with different work states and uh, and trying to limit working process with uh, with uh, with limits is is not a bad idea at all. I I liked it and started working with with those concepts. But in that process, we lost Herbie. We we couldn't find we couldn't find the constraint. Mm. The uh, the general object objection was that in knowledge work there is so much variability that uh, that even if you can pinpoint a constraint in a certain moment, it will just jump around and you get the 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 moving constraint syndrome, the the whack a mole kind of of uh, uh, dynamics where. Where you, you you cannot really reason around a constraint because it's it's moving all the time. It's wandering. It's wandering, yes. And I thought this this cannot be so. There must be a constraint. I, I was totally convinced mm-hmm. by by Goldratt's uh, reasoning that if if you don't see the constraint, it's just that you haven't thought or analyzed or measured enough to actually see that. So that set me off in trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, systematically and eventually the these ideas started to crystallize and the reason why finally to answer your question (laughs) the reason why i wrote this book is to to be able to identify the constraint in knowledge in a systematic way yeah so you know the subtitle is how dr goldrott of the goal would apply the theory of constraints to rethink knowledge work management that's a very ambitious subtitle it is. That's good. I, I like that. I think he would have been very pleased with this. Can we wander back a bit? Because that wandering bottleneck problem has always been kind of like the, the, the little missing bit in Kanban. And when I look back at uh, when, when David introduced Kanban, he put whip limits in, which effectively in theory of constraints term, choked the amount of um, work coming into the system. Uh, and it was kind of like a, a very, very simple but kind of brute force way of doing it. But it did lose the, the bottleneck. And I remember Kanban people saying, no, no, it doesn't matter if the bottleneck um, wanders all around, uh, all over the place. It, but it, it, it does matter. What, what do teams lose in terms of productivity when the bottleneck is one day testing and the next day it's development and the next day it's customer input and the next day it's testing again? What, what do they lose? First, the uh, the idea of whip limits compared to like a freewheeling situation is really good, precisely because it does limit working process, mm. and uh, we know that that has uh, a lot of benefits. The uh, idea that by having whip limits, you do not need to care about where the constraint is is not um, entirely um, correct. It is true that the situation does improve, and it is true that possibly 
eventually you might um, act on uh, on the place where the constraint actually is uh, is located but we must also consider you know, what are the uh, the side effects of these uh, these uh, width limits in actuality what i observe is that they are introducing a lot of additional instability in the system and uh, therefore the appearance of the constraint moving around will be even even greater and uh, if we aim at achieving flow having all this these width limits um, does not really really help uh, in the book i use like the image that it's like putting a, a, a payment toll gate on the German autobahn that every two kilometers. So you cannot cruise around at 200 kilometers per hour because you have to stop, pay and go, stop, pay and go, stop, pay and go all, all the time. So there is some, uh, some inconsistent logic in, in trying to attain flow and then having these, these uh, uh, toll gates all along, along the process. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it gives a greater appearance of a bottleneck wandering around, but most of the time the bottleneck is, is not moving that, um, that often. But then uh, uh, here is where we need to pinpoint how can you actually find this uh, constraint as maybe we should should call it more correctly <laughs> in terms of mm -hmm. terminal. I know you are the bottleneck guy, so so okay, we can call it bottleneck in in our conversation here. Uh, but, but you know, in, in my book, I make a, a distinction between between bottleneck and uh, uh, and uh, cons constraint. Yep. Um, but anyway, we agree. Let's call it Herbie. So uh, what you observe on uh, a Kanban board with or without whip limits, and this impression that you have queues piling up and then disappearing and uh, appearing somewhere else and you put in the whip limits to sort of get some actionable signals so if you have starvation you you know you have to intervene there it doesn't mean it's it's uh it's uh it's the herb it's just for that time being something uh is happening there you are being affected by uh, negative mm -hmm. uh, variation well it, it's uh, it doesn't uh uh, give you the insight, the stability of finding where where the bottleneck really really is. It will appear that it is wandering. So how do we get there? How do we get there? So we need to find something that has more long term stability. The Kanban board will visualize the impact of special cause variation, but nothing on a Kanban board will allow you to reason in terms of common cause variation. I think this is the first. Big big difference between between the Kanban method and uh, and uh, uh, well, I call it tame flow Kanban. So Kanban reinterpreted in the in the sense of TOC. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three levels, three ways to to reason uh, about the constraint in, uh, in knowledge work. And maybe today we'll just start to look in, at the first. Let's see how how far we we get. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And then we can talk again another time. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So as, as you, know, you know, one of the reasons to, to limit work in process is to, to bring stability to, um, to the system. So it becomes more predictable as well. So a bit all the, the, the actionable agile metrics uh, reasoning of, of uh, Daniel Bacanti has explained that in his book in an in outstanding way. Uh, you want the system to be, to be stable so that you can you can do forecasts and uh, keep your your promises. So stability is is really uh, important. Let's assume we are able to reach stability. We mm -hmm. can start off with whip limits. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but I want like the the inflow line to be parallel to the outflow line, so the system is stable. Um, which means that your average flow times and maybe we should. Uh, inform the audience here that I use the term flow time while most of the Kanban literature uses the term cycle time 
which, however, is uh, ambiguous because it has different users in uh, different domains, whether it's lean or operational management. So sh in short, flow time is the time from start to finish of, uh, of your work process. Um, so I was saying, if we have these two lines that become parallel and, uh, and the flow time is stable, it stands to reason that the partial flow times, the in-state flow times, will also uh, acquire a greater stability. And if they are, are stable, then you can also start reasoning in terms of uh, which of these, these um, partial in-state flow times, on average, is the longest one. So in short, which step of the process takes the longest? This is the way I identify mm -hmm. what I call the constraint in the work process. Uh, you will see that I have another two qualifications. One is the constraint in the workflow, and the third one is the constraint in the work execution. They are all facets of the same idea, but um, by focusing on different aspects, um, we can find the, the constraint that is uh, mostly affecting uh, your performance at the moment. So with this idea that we look at the longest average flow times, we, we have a way to identify the constraint in the work process. And remember, this depends on having reached stability first. So you can start off with normal Kanban, reach stability, do these measurements, and then you identify, so to say, the column that is your Herbie column mm -hmm. in, on the Kanban board. Now, once you have done that, then, then you can start reasoning in terms of drum buffer rope. Right. Because that column, uh, like in any situation where, where you have a sequence of uh, uh, interdependent processes with statistical variation, uh, you can manage the impact of variation by putting a buffer in front of the constraint in front of Herbie, sorry, <laughs> and let Herbie you know, give the drum beat and pull in with the rope the next piece of work from from the back. So, so let's see. Let's let's play the bit. You've got um, standard sort of Kanban approach. You've got whip limits on there, and that's calmed everything down, which is good. And then you go and you go, hey, look, which of our um, resources here is the the, the the Herbie, which one's limiting our actual output? You go, you 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 find that, and then you put in what what we in TSE call drum buffer rope, which is that the drums the the, the Herbie, the, the the slowest resource, ding 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 ding, setting a drum beat. You put a pile of work in front of them, um, which on a Kanban board, just making sure that the the, the 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 there are stickies waiting in front of Herbie, and then you make sure that you still limit. The, the work that comes into the system so that it keeps the buffer um, with just enough in there to keep the, the bottleneck, the, the Herbie, busy, but not so many that you got a huge whip. Is that kind of the, the essence of it? Yes, that summarizes this pretty, pretty well. Yes. But then I've got to ask you, what about those whip limits? Well, if you have drum buffer rope, then uh, you can just throw them away. You don't need them because you will limit, limit sorry, the, the amount of uh, work in, in process through the DBR mechanism rather than whip limits. However, we must also say that um, um, as we observed before, whip limits were uh, sort of good to, to detect the impact of special cause variation. The approach that we have outlined here with the maximum uh, average flow time uh, will uh, detect uh, the Herbie because the common cause variation makes Herbie Herbie. Uh, it's the common situation, the stable situation that, uh, that uh, uh, is like endemic in your way of working that sort of guarantees that the Herbie column is the Herbie column. Mm -hmm. However, and this is a very important point, um, by doing so, we, we have lost the mechanism, the fundamental mechanism of the column width limits to give us uh, signals, let's say, at, at runtime while 
the, the work is blowing through the system, that something bad might be affecting some other column in front or after Herbie. But we still sort of want to do that. And in order to do that, I have uh, introduced a quite sophisticated way to m monitor the, uh, the work flowing through these, these boards. I don't want to go into the details now because maybe it would be too much. So we'll skip it for another time. <laughs> and if people are interested, they should go get the book. <laughs> go get the book or hire you or, or, or one of your friends. Great advice. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me just play, play. I'm just playing this back again. So um, just in case people aren't used to the terms common cause variation, that, that's just the natural variation that, that you have. If you've got a, say you have a city and there's no major accidents, there's no major incidents. It, it's the kind of the, just the normal variation that, that, that happens in, in the city, um, in the traffic. And it's just what you'd expect every day. But then special cause is when, oh, a traffic light dies. Uh, and that has a whole lot of knock-on effects across the city, but it's special because it's just a it's just a one-off. Would that be a, a reasonable an analogy? Well, yes. I mean, the traffic is something we can all relate to. So, uh, in your everyday commute to work, uh, you you expect that on average you will uh, employ a certain amount of time, and more or less it's quite uh, quite consistent. Uh, maybe you have a range. I will be there within. Uh, uh, plus minus five or ten, ten minutes, but you, you can recognize there is like uh, some sort of stability, stability with variation. Yep. Yes, so you have a range, but uh, you, you know, it's, it's a normal day. Uh, but then you have, you have uh, the day where maybe you have uh, a puncture and then there is an accident and then the traffic light goes down and then there is a thunderstorm. Well, then you have lots, lots of sources of special cause variation. I wish you never have a day like that, but you know what? Yes, yeah, and that's why every so often, uh, if you live in a big city, uh, your forty-five minute commute might take three hours. Exactly, and and the Kanban board will will like highlight where these accidents and punctures and things like that are uh, are happening. But if you consider your your journey from home to the office and uh, back. Mm -hmm. uh, you will always experience that on a normal day without these uh, uh, accidents or incidents, there will always be some part which typically uh, is, uh, is slower than others. Why? Because maybe it's a road that is narrower, that has uh, more traffic, that is like a bottleneck road, a hurry mm -hmm. road, and you expect to go slower there. This is what I'm trying to detect with this idea of uh, measuring the inflow and the average, uh, sorry, the average in-state mm -hmm. load times. So on average, we know that a certain column is uh, uh, the herbie of the situation. But as we said, you will still have accidents and it's good to be able to detect them. At the same time, and this is very important, you must not like overreact mm -hmm. when such an accident happens. And that is a bit like the drawback you asked before about the drawbacks. Well, one of the many drawbacks of quick limits is that, uh, yes, you get these signals, but then they are so frequent uh, and so inconsistent that, number one, you will have this augmented impression of the wandering uh, Herbie. Mm -hmm. And number two, which is worse, you will overreact. You will try to put in remedies when, uh, when those remedies will not improve your long-term performance. It's like if I'm having an accident today because I have a flat at, uh, at the second turn to the right um, on my way to work, I would try to, to remediate that so that from that day onwards, I will never get uh, flats on the second turn to, to the right. And then tomorrow, maybe I have another accident uh, I, I get uh, an engine failure and I try to do something about that. And I think that's asking, that is actually asking for trouble because you are putting a lot of effort in fixing things which are not the business as usual, normal state of affairs. 
accidents come and and go uh, you overcome them yes of course and maybe you having some small or big uh, big damage but you don't uh, build like a, a, a lot of uh, of remediation uh, around those episodes because they are episodes it is much more important in the example of the traffic to maybe identify where you have the bottleneck on the on the road network and make that road wider or find ways mm -hmm. around that point that will give you a consistent improvement of your daily journey and mm -hmm. um, the uh, the other like parallel we can we can make is that the accident that happens to your car mm -hmm. the special cause variation um well, they they happen to your car, and you fix your car and then move on. Mm -hmm. But the the improvement you do to the bottleneck in the road is something that all of the traffic, all the vehicles on the road, will benefit from. Yeah. So that is a huge um, difference. If you overreact, you will literally waste your improvement focus and energy on things that do not have long-term impact. You have to, to confront the accident and resolve it, no doubt about that, but don't believe that that is putting you on the path of continuous improvement, the process of ongoing improvement. Yeah, that's a lovely way of putting it. Hey, how about if we wrap this bit up and then we can talk again? So can, can I just kind of sum up what you're saying, which is that Time flow is Kanban, but enhanced to make it simpler and faster. Would that be fair? Um, uh, well, with respect to what we have been talking, yes, that is fair. I'd like to, to go back to the source of time flow, which is based on patterns and pattern theory. So if we, if we look at that, we can say that uh, time flow is... Uh, a way of reasoning about knowledge work that is based on patterns and pattern theory and wherein theory of constraints has been completely, how can we say, included. So TOC becomes like a subset of the pattern theory and TOC in the specific case that we are talking about is being applied and uh, made actionable on a Kanban board. So we have like these three levels, patterns, TOC, and Kanban. Kanban just happens to be very, very good at highlighting the things that we need to care about when we want to reason in terms of TOC and knowledge work. Right. Actually, that's, that's the lovely thing with knowledge work is that j just having a board up does make stuff visible that was hidden before. And then when you can see stuff, uh, you, you, you can manage it. Where do people get Tameflow? Your and Daniel's book, where, where do they find that? Well, uh, it is available on, uh, on Amazon, uh, both in paperback and, uh, and Kindle. Uh, you would find it on, on LeanPub, uh, but typically on my site, you will have it with promotions of different sorts. So people can go to tameflow.com. Tameflow.com. T-A-M-E-F-L-O-W dot C-O-M. So that's where Steve and I wrapped up our conversation. He has very kindly agreed to come back and chat to me again. If you're interested in Kanban, if you're interested in TOC, and you like to go deep, go have a look at his book. Now, I think... It's time for us to all go back to work. Thank you very much and uh, talk to you again soon. Bye.